Watching me the wind But if Mickey Flynn should ever find me I'll throw me call shit all behind me And square off on that son of a bitch again He cracked up in a river What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Disciples of Ed, right here on the Always Next Year podcast. I am your host, Rob, joined by my co-host, Steve, and new co-host will be a regular on the show's Shane. Guys, how's it going? Yeah, not so bad. How you doing? Yeah, the Flyers are 2 oh. I can't complain, Shane. How's it going? Fucking wonderful. <laughs> Flyers look like a real hockey team again. All is right in the world. Carter Hart is filthy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that save was just, just straight up sex. I mean, you posted your thing on Twitter, which made me laugh out loud <laughs> on the ride home. Quality work by you, sir, Rob. Um, yeah, man, I'm good. Yeah, make, make an hour loop of it. Put it up on Pornhub. Hilarious. It was beautiful. Literally. Seriously. But yeah, the Flyers are 2-0, and looked great last night. The building was buzzing, Wells Fargo Center, about, I wasn't there, and Shane, you were there, right? So can you attest yeah, we to the fact there. that, uh, I've heard from a number of people that the Wells Fargo Center was as loud for a Flyers game as it's been in years. Oh, after that, three. The five on three. The five on three, that was deafening. Um, yeah. I, I don't know, man, like, outside of... The moments of real highs, it was, like Steve said, it was crazy loud, uh, especially the five-on-three kill there at the end of the second. Um, that was exceptional. But for much of that first period, despite kind of owning that first 15 minutes of the first, like it was it was as quiet as I remember it in recent years. It was kind of strange. Like I don't know if we were feeling out the, you know, the process of this new team uh, or what was going on, but uh, really encouraging from that kill on. Yeah, um, I think they were anticipating like the letdown after that first period. Yeah, I think that's probably accurate. Yeah. <laughs> See, I actually didn't think that they played that well in the first period. They had six sh- six shots on goal. They kind of looked a little bit lethargic. Um, they did what they they kind of had a reputation for doing under Dave Haxtell, which is at home, kind of coming out a little bit flat and not really getting much going right off the bat. But you know, the second period they looked great, and then the third period they put the game away. So. 2-0 now, a 4-3 win over Chicago over in Prague, a 4 to nothing win Carter Hart's first NHL shutout last night in the, I guess, official home opener for the Philadelphia Flyers. What are your guys' thoughts on this team? And uh, Shane, we'll start with you. What are your guys' thoughts on this team so far through the first two games? Uh, I'm encouraged. Um, honestly, the lines uh, and the pairings entering into these first two games... I don't want to say left some to be desired, but it was certainly a, a different look than I was anticipating. Um, and, and seeing the way that they're kind of gelling together, um, I really actually, I really liked uh, Elaine Vigneault's comment last night in the presser afterwards, where he kind of, he has this pace of play that he wants to establish. And he mentioned the importance of short and, uh, I can't remember the word that he used, but essentially 30 to 35 second shifts is, is what he wants his guys to, to use. And, feeling that rhythm of the game is something that is going to be an adjustment for, for some of these guys. Um, you know, especially with the shuffling of lines as consistently as it happened in her hack. Um, but where you saw those moments of kind of lag that you were talking about and like, I don't want to say discombobulation, but, um, you know, you, you noticed, and again, Elaine Mignot kind of hinted at that. It was when guys got caught not being able to, take the 30 to 35 second shifts and they got caught out there for the 60 seconds or 75 seconds. Um, and they weren't quite as crisp or sharp and it took a few shifts to, to recapture that, that rhythm and flow that Elaine Vigneault wants to attack with and wants to have his presence with. I think that's going to be one of the biggest things to, to look for and to understand with this new system. And for me, I find that really exciting. Yeah, I'm a hundred percent on board with that. One of the things that I noticed, I noticed it a little bit in the season opener, but I noticed it a lot more last night. They're so much more aggressive. Under Hackstall, they're they're a very, you know, laid-back team. They didn't really force the issue a whole lot with their opponents. Defensively, they're very aggressive. They always had their sticks in the passing lane. Great on the back check. Good on the forecheck as well in the uh, offensive end. And 
they did so much to draw the penalties that were such a huge part. They went, uh, what was it, two for four on the power play last night? I don't recall the stats offhand, but sure. I, think, I right. think it was two for four on the power play, but they made the plays that they needed to make to kind of force the issue with the Devils and force them into taking those penalties. And that's that's something that we never saw under Dave Haxley. You didn't see that kind of aggression. You didn't see that kind of going out there and forcing th- uh, forcing the issue with the opposing team. So that's a really encouraging thing to see under Elaine Vigneault. Uh, Steve, what's the uh, what are some of the biggest differences that you've noticed so far in the Flyers play this season under AV? Um, just like full, like I guess what they say in hockey is compete level. Um, it just seems like they're playing the closest to sixty minutes than we've ever seen under Dave Haxtell. Um, I think that's perfect. Um, the players are just gelling better than I think we've seen before, especially with the short notice on the lines. I think Shana just mentioned um, everything about that. You know. The power play is actually doing well. The penalty kill looked outstanding. Great. Especially Five on three for a full two minutes, man. Literally, like, minute nine, 59 and a half, which is absurd. But um, yeah, just thanks. how they did that with, um, oh, man, who, who was on it? Raffle and Lawton. Raffle playing yeah. center on it. Mm-hmm. And they just played it extremely well. And then, like, we also talked about the deafening, like, cheers after that it's just really good to see especially for the penalty kill this year just keep that consistent all year along with carter hart and i think they can really go far and at that point it was still a one nothing game i believe and they killed off that five on three yeah we're talking about a totally different hockey game yeah if that if carter hart doesn't make that save and that's the difference oh, yeah. that's the difference that that a goaltender of carter hart's potential makes when you have a goaltender that you can count on to stand on his head more nights than not you are going to come away with those momentum, you know, games because that place got crazy after that. And again, that was yeah. towards the back end of that five on three. I think at that point it was five on four um, for that half second. I think that yeah. was like pretty much the very, very drop dead end. Uh, how of the how two was man. it all from your view? Because you were was, in a different seat than I was. I was completely it was like filthy. behind the net on the other end. Uh, Steve, you're there as well. Yeah, yeah. he was there on, on the opposite end as me. Um, so it was crazy. So my left eye had this perfect view of it. My right eye was right below the, the glass line that's up there now, the plexi. Oh, yeah. So I was, I was all cross-eyed and dizzy-like, uh, which honestly I think made it look even freaking cooler because um, <laughs> it made it look like the shot went two extra feet further and Carter Hart's body just extended two extra feet further than a human can actually extend. <laughs> so like it was bizarrely satisfying. Um, so I got to react like twice, once with my left eye and once with my right. It was really impressive. <laughs> um, but it was wild, man. I, I mean, it was uh, it was as good of a, a post-to-post move there uh, with an extension from a glove that I've seen from a Flyers goaltender in some time. And it looked natural, unlike the fakeness that was Steve Mason. And Michael yeah. Lean. <laughs> Michael Layton, too. They both did that split. The split. Yep. 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 Oh, I, I wish, had, wish we had a camera in Did you see Michael Layton retired and, like, the picture on, like, the article was him doing a split glove save on, like, the, of the course epitome of his career. That's especially it. Especially with the Flyers, because it was the Flyers jersey. That and all 48 other teams he played for. <laughs> so I've got to say, watching the game on television last night, it seemed like the crowd didn't really realize that Carter Hart had made the save. It seemed like the crowd maybe thought the puck went off the outside of the net or something like that because there wasn't really a huge initial reaction to it. It wasn't until, really, I think that they showed the replay on the scoreboard. Can you guys confirm that or deny it? Or was, oh, it was what's crazy. There? Yeah, I, I, right I, I, had, to, bat when I 100% the had a delayed reaction because of where I was sitting. That probably makes sense. So for us, like I said, my left eye had the, a, the good view. My right eye, again, <laughs> the askewed. Um, so I, I, got, I got like a back-to-back, it just snap, snap, re- reaction twice. Um, our side of the rink was certainly immediately reactionary to that. Like, we understood what was happening. I will say this, it wasn't a clean snag. Um, you know, so like there was that moment of like, oh, shit. And then like, what an incredible save. And then there was that, man, is he in an, a remotely okay enough position to make any type of a stop? And then we got that puck clear. Um, he's unbelievable, but it was, yeah. it was great, man. It was, it was so good to see. Like I said, that, that to me was the, the difference in that game. You know, that's, they tie that game up. You know, there's, there's enough talent on the New Jersey side that they would have made it or could have made it significantly more interesting, but you kill a five on three like that and then come out there with two quick goals, less than what, 15 seconds apart from each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, third period, yeah. You know, that's, there's a lot to be really excited about with this hockey team. It's something that we haven't had the chance to feel for four years under hack. Yeah, it's, I think it's one of the most dominant performances that I've seen 
in a few years at least. The Flyers, they had their share of dominant games under Hagstall, but they're kind of few and far between. They go 100%. out there and do that in a second game under AV. And mind you, the Devils are a winless team right now, but they're a talented team. They're just, I think maybe it's just a case of all the new guys in the roster that kind of haven't really gotten a feel for each other yet. That's a good hockey team over there, a lot of talent there. And to go out and pitch a 4 nothing shutout over them on the national stage on uh, Wednesday night, uh, whatever they call it, on NBC. Uh, it's just Wednesday night hockey. Just Wednesday night hockey. Wednesday night hockey. Yeah. Whatever, whatever, Doc Emmerich and uh, yeah. Eddie, what's Eddie Ulchick. So yeah. national stage, the Flyers go out. Carter Hart gets his first NHL shutout. Very impressive, four nothing win. Um, I really think it was a statement game by Carter Hart, to be honest. Yeah, like, yeah I am here. This is my league now. Oh, Showed yeah. it to the whole world too, <laughs> because they were the only. I believe they were the only team that was on NBC last night. Now um, Vancouver the late was on game. Afterwards, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, um, so and Steve, we'll start with you with this question: What is your confidence level in the team after what you've seen so far in the first two games? Well, I'm going to go refer to my parks bet here, and I'm a lot more comfortable, <laughs> a lot more confident in them winning the East. <laughs> um, I'm 100% more confident because, you know, once... How much do you wager on that? It was 5 bucks, but it pays out it's only $5. Five. It's only $5. Um, <laughs> and I did that with, like, zero expectations. I just said, fuck it. But um, right now, watching them play the full game and then, like, the bits and pieces I saw against Chicago, this is a team with, with Vigneault at the helm. I think they can really do extremely well and even with like these lines again they were put together like the very after the preseason basically and they're gelling like drew couturier linha limblom together that they're just a perfect mesh to be honest and we we're all confused like drew's away from couturier like how's this going to work out kevin hayes has done really well mm-hmm. and i'll say that and every time he touched the puck i said seven million dollars <laughs> a lot of people laughed um <laughs> But it just seems like like they have this depth, even without Nolan Patrick right now. It's crazy. Like the depth players are still like playing their roles, and I like Pitlick like, a lot seeing him play. And um, I think Raffle should be playing more. And you keep getting these guys, keep getting these strong kills, strong power plays at the right at the right time. They can really go far. And then when you get to the playoffs, it's just all about the bracket. They could win the East. Hot yeah. take. There, you there, go. Go. <laughs> there it is. They've got the talent certainly this year. It's I, cr- was Vigneault at all on either of your brains as a potential head coaching candidate here? He was on mine. Yours? Yeah. Because I don't think he was on ours. I don't, I don't think so, because I was looking at, like, really under-the-radar guys. Right. You were looking at, like, AHL coaches in, what, Edmonton? <laughs> yeah. Jay Woodcroft. Um, that's right. That's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Jay, Jay Woodcroft, Woodcroft was my guy for, like, two different hires. <laughs> was that uh, Toronto Marlies? <laughs> no, nah, uh, he was uh, the Sharks assistant to Tom McClellan, then he went to the Oilers, yeah. and then they just said, hey, run our AHL team, and he did really well with them. He's going to be an NHL head coach. It's just crazy to sit here and think. I mean, I, I can't think of a more perfect hire. I mean, obviously, we're just two games in, yeah. um, you know, through the first seven months of the season, yeah. it feels. My second game hot take is the Flyers um, the East. Yeah, right. <laughs> but just the personality and everything that kind of comes along with what Elaine Vigneault was, it's just, you want to talk about shaking a culture uh, of four years of just, like, just dead air and nothingness. Man, I, I mean, Black stairs. Yeah, yes. and Rob, you were down there for it all. Um, yeah. I actually man, dozed I'm... off in a couple of those posters there. <laughs> really? I'm not even kidding. That's I, impressive. I legitimately did, and it's they were only like five minute long pressers. and I nobody gave you a nudge. No, because I, I sat in the back. <laughs> disrespectful. I sat in the back, <laughs> and so there's nobody sitting either seat next to me. There you go. But yeah, uh, like five minute pressers, and I was falling asleep halfway through them. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I'm I'm certainly on board. I think that the talent has been there. They just needed the coach to kind of get it out of them. Dave Hackstall clearly wasn't that guy. Elaine Vino, a guy who's been around the block a number of times, and the guys he brought in, Mike Yo and Michelle Terrian, all have a reputation of getting in their players' faces when they're not playing up to their standards and getting the most out of them. And with the young hockey club, that's what you need. You can't have a Dave Haxtell who's laid back, who's given blank stares and boring answers to the media and stuff like that. No, you need a head coach and you need a coaching staff around him who's going to hold all the players accountable. That's the biggest thing that you can have with a talented young hockey team. Yeah, I think the biggest thing now, and, and this is all, this is not just in, in the NHL, this is all across sports, more so than than a knowledge of the game, you need to be able to connect with your players. You know, managing you know, this many personalities uh, across sports and, and the, the dollar of contracts that that are 
commanded by seven million dollar year haze um <laughs> you know you almost need just a therapist you know you, you just need a, a psychologist to walk in the door uh with a little bit of hockey knowledge and we i think have uh like i don't want to say a, a psychologist because i think that people would jump off the roof if they had a lame video screaming at him like that um but he's He's a hell of a motivator right now. He's got these guys believing. I know it's only two games in. We don't want to overly, overly react. But I think that in today's sports, he's a guy who gets it. And I I fully appreciate that. Yeah, I think that all of Philadelphia certainly does. Uh, certainly more so than Dave Haxtell. Because Dave Haxtell was the most anti-Philadelphia coach you could possibly imagine. Oh, him defending McDonald with that season ticket holders. No, oh, that was terrible. That was yeah. awful. Well, was one of a number of brutal <laughs> Dave Haxtell moments. Anyway, as you may recall, Dave Haxtell was fired after the Flyers' most recent visit to Vancouver last season, which is their next uh, game coming up was a Saturday night, I believe, yes. out in Vancouver. That kicks off a three-game Western Canada road trip. Start off with the Canucks, who got their first win last night, an 8-2 win over the LA Kings, and then you move on to Johnny Hockey in Calgary, and then you move on to McDavid and the Oilers. What are your guys' thoughts on uh, what the Flyers can do out in Western Canada? Do you see this being a challenging trip for them? Do you think they can have success out there? Uh, Shane, we'll start with you. Uh, what, three-game swing, yeah. Yes. Uh, I could see four to five points in, in that swing, uh, you know, legitimately. Um I think right now it's it's more a question of not so much who's across the ice from the Philadelphia Flyers, but how how consistently they're able to sit there and mesh in their own new system and how these lines continue to work. Um, and then if they begin to falter, uh, what kind of response you see from Vigneault and the coaching staff. Right now it's been fairly smooth sailing through these two, through these two games. Um, so for me, you know, I, I think that um, you know it's. I think it's going to be a more positive Western uh, Western trip out there for us than than what we would have had in recent years. That's our dog in the studio, by the way. Bryce is just yeah. I was kind of distracted, back. like answering because I was trying to like, calm him down. <laughs> I know, right? He's a pain in the <laughs> ass. <laughs> He's excited about the Flyers soon. I'll start. 100%. He genuinely hockey is the only sport he watches because he's a good fucking dog. He's a good dog. He's a good dog. Unless he's in studio, then he's kind of a pain in the dick, but he's just staring at us right now. So <laughs> Enjoying the Flyers talk. So That's what he's he done. 100%. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Steve, what do you got on this Western trip? Um, I think I agree with you. Four to five points, and I think Elliot starts one of these games, which so is where I. they get that zero or one. And um, Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Bryce Harvey Talker said, I'm free. Well, they do. <laughs> they have the back-to-back uh, Tuesday and Wednesday at Calgary and then at Edmonton. So, yes. yeah, Brian Elliott's going to get the start in one of those two games. Yeah. Which one would you start him in? I would start him in the Edmonton game because Calgary's a better team. Me too. And that's how I feel. You always, like, in back-to-backs, I'm of the opinion that you start your backup goaltender against the weaker team. Absolutely. And you always split these back-to-backs. I don't care how well... Mm-hmm. Your goalie played the game before. You've got a shot out. You still give him that rest. That's why in recent years the Flyers today's... would always face the Chad Johnsons of the world when their, <laughs> their opponent was in the second half of back to back. Yeah, first or, or second half. Or Whenever the... their opponent was in a back to back, they would always face the backup goalie. Yep, and every NHL team should even this year still start their backup goalie against us because the history speaks for itself. It really, really does. It really does. It's kind of a shame. But yeah, I, I think we'll do well. You know, four to five points. Um, it's just a matter like it, it does suck like this traveling um for the beginning of the season but i think given what we've seen so far i there's no cause for pessimism right now honestly I agree. crazy the happy flyers podcast i know, I know. Right? it's <laughs> been a love long it. ass time it's, it's been, been two games but still there's no reason for pessimism right now with how they've played uh, who was it? Uh, dan the fly era fan who we did a show with, um, I think it was over the summer at some point, he posted something on Twitter last night that was pretty funny, that <laughs> he didn't know how oh. to physically process the Flyers having a good team. A fun team. Yeah. Yeah, our, it's crazy. I, I mean, so the Flyers, all right, so here's a good point for it. I, I think that in Philadelphia, I think in most cities, if you're a quote-unquote 4-for-4 four four guy or 3-for-3, three three, however many teams you have, I think the one that usually garners the least amount of interest is hockey, right, which is ridiculous hockey's fantastic um so yeah for me it's baseball but so i Actually, i agree um 
But uh, what were you going to say? Actually, then I started thinking about like, yeah, it's actually probably basketball. <laughs> I guess for you. Yeah. Um, yeah basketball's really fallen. I lie on every episode of every segment I'm on <laughs> and say that whatever sport I'm on is like the highest of interest to me, except <laughs> for football. I ne- I will always cement that f- football comes forth to me. I don't know why. It just is. Um, but you start seeing you know casual fans or fans who are every year. So both both the high hopes coast uh coast hosts you really uh, love saying chris coast i know really <laughs> coast man he's 33 years old he gives me hope i still <laughs> I got know. three years to make it um i don't know why but i saw a highlight of him hitting a home run against the mets i know day. i keep seeing it too <laughs> it's all over twitter and i have no idea why um it's probably his maybe put out another book who knows <laughs> yeah um but the two high hopes listener or uh hosts uh <laughs> jack and uh Jack, Anna, and James. Neither one of them are particularly hockey guys, and each one of them tweeted the same freaking thing. <laughs> every year I say I'm going to get to the Flyers, and every year the openers happen, and I say this is why I'm not into the Flyers. Both of them are like, this is a fun freaking hockey team. How many people can can sit there and say over the last four years that like watching an opener in particular, outside of the Washington game two years ago, um, you know, where you can sit there and, and say, this is a fun fucking hockey team. If this keeps up with this type of intensity and this type of passion that we're seeing, they're going to bring in a hell of a lot more fans this year in, in Philadelphia. And man, there's so much to be excited about. Like Steve said, zero reason for pessimicity. Pessimicity? Pessimism? Pessimism. 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 I said not it enough twice, coffee. So. Next dude. <laughs> Pessimicity. Making shit up here on DOA. Yeah. Making shit up as you drink out of that Batman cup. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is the NyQuil in there? There's not NyQuil in this. Uh, so NyQuil is straight. <laughs> no, there's not. No whiskey. <laughs> Steve didn't bring any. Oh, man. That's surprising. Anyway, yeah, a lot to look forward to with this Flyers uh, season. A lot of re- uh, reason to be optimistic. Um, but one of the things that the Flyers will be challenged with is the travel early on. <laughs> Steve, you alluded to it a couple moments ago. The travel from Prague back to Philadelphia. Philadelphia out to Western Canada, and do you guys, Shane, we'll start with you, do you think that it's good to get all this travel out of the way early in the season so it's not a problematic thing later on, or would you rather have them later well, uh, travel later on? Genuinely, I don't think it matters. I don't um, think it matters? Yeah, I think if when you're when you're a professional athlete, I think the, the hardest thing is finding continuity within new systems, or within, within new lines, and I think that it's hard when you have coaching staffs who are incredibly reactionary, as Hackstall was. And not that we want to keep continuing to bring up that miserable era of hockey that we just endured, but I don't think that with this current coaching regime that we're going to see a lot of reactionary, impulsive, just we're making changes, we're making changes, and never really get into a rhythm. I think if they come out flat next game, it's they're going to come out in game four and with the same freaking lines and pairings. You know, the only I think the only change we could end up seeing is a seventh defenseman giving getting a night in, uh, and and that's it. But um, I don't really think the travel matters whatsoever. I think that you know it's just we're just going to be playing a lot of crunch hockey down down in the back end. That's all. Yeah, this kind of reminds me of a situation. I think it was back in the oh seven oh eight season, which was also coming off an off season in which the Flyers made a lot of moves. Um, they retained John Stevens as their head coach that year, but they brought in a whole bunch of new players. And they had a Western Canada trip, which started in Vancouver early in that season. And I specifically remember during an interview, I think it was Mike Richards uh, talking about how the team, there, there was a lot of bonding that went on out there. They went on a ski trip. They went on a whole bunch of different things out there. And that could help out this year's team. A lot of new personnel, the the new coaches, uh, being able to go out, you know, spend some team time together out in Western Canada, maybe do some of the same same things that they did back then. So it could actually be beneficial to them. Lane Vigneault takes the entire team out to get a fake classic shave so they can all (laughs) absorb the homeless look that he has. They go to some really classy barber shop and he's like, it's like, all right, everybody, we're, we're going to be a fucking flyer today. And they all sit down in the chair, and they just get an electric razor and quickly do it like, oh, we're in a fucking rush right now. Oh, we got to get to the fucking rink. And then they all walk out there looking homeless. And I love it. How can you not? Right. He's one of us. Is Carter Hart even capable of growing Absolutely face not. Yeah, well, much like me, but he's a lot better athlete. There you go. Well, you look just like TK, man, just with, you know. A lot more fat. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. I was going to say. Yeah, you're too kind. Yeah. Right, so, uh, a lot more girth. 
Girth. There you go. <laughs> hey, and that can be attributed to any particular characteristic of you. We'll let the listeners decide here on DOE. Female listeners. Ah, well, male. It's 2019. Who cares? Let's keep the female. <laughs> I appreciate the flattery, males, but keep the female. All right, so Steve, what's your take on the effect that this, this uh, Western Canada trip could have on the team? Uh, I think, like I've said before, like it does seem strenuous. Strenuous? Strenuous? Strenuous. Strenuous. We're really bad with words right now. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, you can it, blame it on the alcohol. Yeah, I can. Shame <laughs> <that> I can't. <laughs> you can blame it on the coffee. But, um, yeah. <laughs> coffee. It, it seems like it would be strenuous. I think that back-to-back kind of might. I think that's where you'll see, like, the potential, like, loss, OT loss. Um, but I think getting out of the way is kind of nice. But I just also am looking at the schedule, and it's crazy that we're playing Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton all away. Bryce gets away for two seconds. Yeah, he's right. announcing his presence. <laughs> and then we're playing Dallas, Vegas, and then Chicago. Like, and that's two home and then one away. Like, it's just crazy that we're getting the West kind of out of the way, like in general on the schedule. And then it's just going to add to like these tough matchups later on the season. So it'll be interesting to see later on. But yeah, it, it, I feel like it would be tiring, you know going around but at least like they're going from here to canada and kind of like in the same same vicinity yeah um so i think they'll they'll figure it out me i'm happy in a sense that these night games are getting out of the way these that's are- true <laughs> yeah 10, me, o'clock. 10 o'clock swings yeah, yeah. does I'm, suck i'm i'm old now and i can't do i can't watch them anymore <laughs> like i watch like the first period and then i just end up passing out like mid-second and i was falling asleep in the middle like in the beginning of the second yeah, it's pretty rough so i can't contribute to the podcast as well as I want to. <laughs> See, I have no problem staying up late for these games. I just get pissed off because when these games end at 1 o'clock in the morning, it means that I don't have any time for Netflix before I go to sleep. <laughs> That's and a I, thing for you? Yeah, I, I mentioned something about it when I was watching the um, the NLDS, the Dodgers, and the Nationals last night. I wanted them to get the game over with so I could watch a couple shows on, on Netflix before I went to sleep. I needed him to get that over with because I was recording TJ's One of Us with Scott. <laughs> yeah, well. I, I got home from the game, texted Scott, and I was like, hey, man, do you want to, you know, I just got home when you want to record. And he's like, oh, I'm good to go now. And then I looked and I was like, man, that's just went back to back. Do you want to <laughs> wait to the end of this game? And he's like, oh, absolutely. Well, that was a dumb decision by me because then it goes into extras. And then that was the worst ending freaking ever. Yeah, Joe Kelly just, I mean, first off, Dave Kershaw, Roberts, but- terrible. <laughs> Joe Kelly just absolutely imploded. But anyway, fuck the Dodgers, fuck the Nationals, fuck both those teams. Yeah, fuck L.A. L.A. doesn't deserve championships. Neither does Washington, so hopefully St. Louis takes care of business there. Yeah. Anyway, back to the topic at hand here, which is Philadelphia Flyers hockey. We're going to move on to the Ask DOE segment, Ask Disciples of Ed. We got, I picked uh, three questions that I received on Twitter, and so... I picked the three best ones. I actually got a handful of them, but the three best ones. If yours was not included this time, continue to ask away. We'll eventually get around to you. You can find us on Twitter at AMY Podcast. You can submit your questions there. You can submit your questions to me at Radio underscore Rob. And you guys, if you want to take questions, you can do it as well. Why don't you drop your, uh, Shane, why don't you drop your Twitter handle? Uh, It's at Shane underscore Mead. All right, Steve, where can we find you? At Schmini324. So yeah, hit us up on any of those social media accounts. Give us your questions. We will answer them eventually. Anyway. If you're a friend of mine on Facebook, just shoot me on Messenger. Or that. Yeah. Hoping some of my friends actually you know, listen to the show. I know a couple do. Well, what kind of friends would they be if they didn't? Yeah, it's true. It's true. I say it. It'd be- you guys are my friends, so <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty tough. I don't interact with humans. <laughs> All right, so the first question I've got here... Can the Flyers sustain the special team success that they have had so far? And Steve, we'll start with you. I really am not so sure about the power play. I'm still getting accustomed to this whole Giroux on the right. And, um, yeah, so I'm not 100% sure on that. And it really depends on the second unit. I think the second unit has scored a power play goal already, which is promising. Um, the penalty kill, I'm a lot more confident in because Yo has typically run a good penalty kill, and we have the personnel to do so and um, like name me one player that really couldn't play the penalty kill on this team and it's probably just jake Voracek and maybe connect me 
That sounds about right. I think even Konechny could go out there if they really, really needed him to. Yeah, I agree with that because he he would be like your Grabner in a way where he can just use utilize his speed on a turnover and get the shorty. Exactly. So I am really confident in them uh, on the penalty kill this year. And then, you know, adding in Carter Hart, like we've mentioned, it's... The best penalty killer. Yeah, it is the biggest upgrade they've gotten as well on the penalty kill. So I think... 100% 100% the penalty kill can sustain, say I'm 75% on the power play. It feels so damn good to finally have a goalie. But, yes, um, it does. Shane, what are your thoughts? Uh, do you think the Flyers will be able to sustain the success that they had on special teams? Uh, I mean, not to 100% echo Steve, but yes. <laughs> um, I, my My confidence, again, oddly shifting from last year, is uh, is definitely more so with the with the PK uh, for the exact same reasons as Steve said that the depth there is great the speed is really good um, they seem far more uh, like uh, I don't want to say like athletic but aggressive yeah that's, that's like probably the right yeah, amount it, of aggressiveness exactly it, it's last year there was just so much just fall back and let them shoot 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 until a puck found them <laughs> that they can attempt to clear. This year, it's they're not putting themselves in in poor position by their their aggression, but they're certainly forcing you know passes or, or closing lanes quicker than I remember them in, in recent years. Um, so that I, I fully believe, and again, Carter Hart, a big part of that, I believe, is sustainable. The power play itself, uh, or the, our power play, is I think it's it's just it's weird seeing things run the way that it's being being run right now. It's weird seeing a guy who is top three in the NHL in points and always top of, of power play points from one spot for almost the entirety of his career, now flipping sides of the ice there. The one thing I will say is I was encouraged by the fact that on several of these power plays, they are circling through and they are shifting their positions and, and who's running those power plays and where these setups are. I, I think it's just going to... It's just going to sit there and break down to the personnel that that ends up on ice. Yeah, and I, I just want to interject there. It, it was the first period, I think. It was their first power play. Mm-hmm. There was at least two Shane Gossespierre one-timers, maybe three. Two. Two. And I was, like, telling my sister, who I always go to the home opener with, I'm like, this is what I've always wanted. Just run the power play through a ghost slap shot. I've mentioned it here numerous times. Oh, yeah. Just run it through the ghost slap shot, and things will go well. Yeah, I certainly agree. It seems like there's a lot more creativity to their power play. It was very vanilla under Dave Haxtell. Um, a lot more aggression on both sides, both the power play and the penalty kill. And I think that's it's a huge asset to the penalty kill to have the guys be, I guess you'd say, selectively aggressive. In other words, aggressive but staying in their position. And it, it's been paying dividends so far. Um, I think they were much too laid back, both on the power play and on the penalty kill, before and now under AV. You know, you have a power play that is more aggressive in getting shots on goal. Uh, we saw it with Provrov with the opening goal last night, just firing the puck on that. Oh, we that was great. With uh, Kevin Hayes pouncing on the um, the faceoff, the loose puck in front of the net, and getting the second power play goal. Yeah. And then, yeah, the penalty kill, especially on the 5-on-3 that they killed off. Getting in passing lanes, being active with the stick, not giving the opposing team too much room to work with, and yeah, I think it's 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 all a um, I don't know what you call it. I'm, I'm missing the word here, but uh, yeah, it all has to do with the game plan, and that's why I think that it's it's going to be sustainable throughout the season. I think fluid might have been the word. It might have been yeah, <laughs> fluid. Rolls off the tongue nicely. Yeah, fluid. (laughs) Fluid. Moving on to our second question here. As someone who lives in New York, I know firsthand that Kevin Hayes has a reputation for being lazy. He appeared to have a lot of jump in his step last night. Do you see hustle being an issue for him this season, or can we expect more of what we saw from him last night? And Shane, we'll start with you. Uh, He's making $7 million a year, so he, he better do. He better hustle. Well, I wanted um, to start with that. Why so bad? Hate, <laughs> absolutely hate the hustle questions in professional sports. Yeah, um, I, I think it's absolutely absurd to sit there and expect people to do that uh, and go at one hundred percent all the time. Obviously, we would love that. It's just I don't want to say it's impossible. It's not, but like you, guys, we we all work. You guys work. Um, 
you know, this is true. We work. You guys work. Do you give 3,000% every single second of your, of your day at work? Are you hustling around doing things? Hell no. You're on Twitter. You're texting your ladies. Or... I max out at 70. There you go. <laughs> I'm Maxing out at 70. <laughs> 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 but, like, it's impossible. Anything that we do in our everyday lives or our professional lives, nothing gets done at 100% 100% of the time. Just um, sex. People phone that shit into. Let's be serious here. Um, so few and far between. Sorry, it's just me. <laughs> well, you're a very generous lover, Steve, for all of our female listeners. He looks like TK. And, yeah. With more girth. With more. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's going to sound strange to listeners. <laughs> Just a snapshot of that clip alone. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's the most Google the, thing after it. 100%. Travis Connecting. Travis Connecting. <laughs> <laughs> is it the Nick Folesian effect? Is he the new? Um but no, I, I don't. I don't have any concerns long term with uh, with Hayes and, and Hustle or, or Motor or anything like that. Um, first of all, he had mentioned, and Elaine Vigneault has been pretty. Uh, I don't want to say he's been aggressive, but he's been very vocal about what he demands of his players. And Vigneault has coached him. Vigneault Hayes credits Vigneault for making you know his his game two dimensional. I mean, he wasn't. He didn't come into the league that way. Um, you know, he, he, he takes a lot of pride in his defense too. So yeah, I don't, uh, I don't care if he takes off uh, a shift here or there and he's not a hundred percent. I, it is what it is, man. Steve, what do you got? Um, I, I'm trying to like look up frantically, but it's not cooperating, but yeah. It's, Outside of Hayes' rookie year, this is the best team that Hayes has probably played on. Like mm-hmm. overall depth wise, just roster wise. And I think that's why who will stand out a little bit more because he's got more help. So you might see him making this play like basically on his own, but he's getting the help from like his wingers and his defensemen that he wasn't getting before. And I think that's where people think it's hustle or lack of hustle. So he's making this play, but that's because he doesn't have to worry about you know the guy on the wing or the guy that's behind him. He knows that he's got a solid player around him. He could take a risk. Yes. Thank you. Because I couldn't finish that. <laughs> um be okay. quite funny you guys help me out on some of my rants yeah but and then other than that is he's making seven million dollars a year <laughs> plus and he better be doing these at least at the very least he should be putting up 45 points and then doing these plays that we're seeing him do so far after two games i'll that, tell you that's all i got <laughs> i'll tell you what he looked like he had a lot of jump in a step on that i think it was on a penalty kill actually where he went down the ice and he's able to get an edge on the devil's defender and Cut around to get a. That was him coming out the box. Yeah, yeah, right out of the box. Right out of the box. Okay, and he ended up with a great scoring chance because of it. I thought that he was just gonna go to the forehand and shoot from, I guess, the uh, the near side of the net. If you're looking at where the uh, camera angle is, instead he is able to cut around, go to the far side, and get an even better scoring chance there. Yeah. My head cannon on that instance was they were both coming out of the box at the same time. Him and Couturier was like, all right, Coots was probably like, all right, you're a little bit faster than me, so you go after <laughs> you it. go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, and then the power play goal, uh, being able to get to the front and then pounce on that that loose puck right off the face off there. Yeah, um, I, it seemed like the Devils kind of fell asleep there a little bit, and then Hayes found himself with the puck, and fairly easy goal. But yeah. Yeah. I watched that play like by the bar behind my seats, and like so I was by the bar in the bathroom and watched it through like a hundred people all the way across the ice. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my god, it went in! Yes. <laughs> So that was that was an experience. <laughs> All right, so our third and final question here, and this actually is a jersey question. I desperately need a new Flyers jersey, but I don't believe in wearing goalie jerseys because I always jinx them, so Carter Hart's out of the equation here. <laughs> I have narrowed it down to Konechny, Provi, and Sanheim. A, who should I go with, or one, who should I go with, and also, should I get the home, away, or the black alternate? And Steve, we'll start with you. Who was it? Konechny, Provy, or Sanheim? Yes. Hmm. Sanheim. 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 I was going to go. Sanheim and away. Sanheim away. Yeah, just to be different. What about you, Shane? Well, because I'm going to be different from you, I'm going to go Konechny <laughs> and home. I'm a big fan of the black jerseys. <laughs> I'm going to go with what you have sitting in the corner of the studio over there. Provorov, black, alternate. Yeah, well, I don't know. I'm so usually... we have helped you 
None whatsoever. Yeah, right. <laughs> Buy one of everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, seriously. Just keep I hope you're well off like the guy from Beckard Beers and, ba- and Football. I'm baseball. Beckard Beers and Baseball. <laughs> you have a better car than he does. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, true. Clunker. <laughs> but yeah, you know, just, you know, look at them, see what might be cheaper, and just wing it. Just wing it. Because they're all solid options every which they way, are. outside of the black jersey. Um, that's my personal opinion. Black jerseys are dope. <laughs> I didn't like the old one that they had with the orange piping. But I I dig the fuck out of this. What uh, is that the 2008 one, the Richards yeah, one? Oh not man, a fan of those. I like those. See, I, I I'm gonna tangent here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm standing in line for the bathroom wearing my Mike Richards Winter Classic jersey, which I appreciated. Yeah, and the the other jersey I have is Mike Richards. You know, those 2008 black jerseys. And this kid was like, I, I, I he looked older, but he said, "Oh man, I was nine years old, and I uh I love Mike Richards, but the only jersey I had was that terrible black jersey." And I'm like. Well, you can fuck right off. That's not the worst jersey they ever had. Because he said it was the worst jersey that 3D. they ever had. And I'm like, yeah, the 3D one. And then I realized he said he was nine years old in 2008. And I'm like, shit, man, I'm old and you're young and there's worse jerseys and you could do better. <laughs> so, yeah, Helping that's, that's, out. A, that's a side tangent. <laughs> the worst jersey ever is the 50th anniversary with the gold outline that and the logo. Retarded. Ridiculous. Uh, yeah, that yeah. Was, that's uh, pretty bad. I've forgotten that on my memory and erased it. But it still happened, and I'm just happy. Like, I never see those jerseys. I see them every once in a while, once in a blue moon. But you see the 3D jerseys a lot more. You know what needs to come back? The 2012 Winter Classic that they wore for Wars Alder. I love that. Years. Yeah. I have a forward check one of those jerseys. That needs to come back. What about that fake fake uh, Winter Classic jersey? With the, uh, the, the younger year? Cursive? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, like, the four stripes or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> Seen a number of those around lately, actually. Yeah, people thought it was real and they bought them. Yeah. They don't look terrible, but they look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Not terrible, but stupid. What's the difference? Well, terrible is terrible, and stupid just like yeah, it could be like some things look okay, but they're stupid. Yeah, like you know, that attractive female. She's very attractive, but she's stupid. Like me. You're an attractive female, but stupid. No, I'm an attractive <laughs> male, but stupid. <laughs> okay, glad you clarified. <laughs> Man, I was confused by that whole term right there. <laughs> I don't know if it's the Nyquilla case that I'm in right now, but man. Some things are look terrible, or don't look terrible, but are stupid. Yeah. All right. There you go. Okay. Scott Lawton in that in his original jersey with the 49, that looks terrible. Well, it doesn't look terrible, but it's stupid because <laughs> he's wearing 49. I'm not that drunk, I swear. God damn it. Right. <laughs> no, yeah, you're only it. drinking fucking yingling right now. You shouldn't be. I did some whiskey earlier, be. but still. <laughs> All right, so uh, last night, in addition to marking Carter Hart's first NHL shutout in the Flyers, official home opener of the season, also marked uh, longtime Flyer Wayne Simmons' return to Philadelphia after signing with New Jersey. Yeah, of course, he was let go, traded by the Flyers to Nashville last season. Didn't really play much for Nashville became a free agent, signed with the Devils. Uh, what are your, and Shane, we'll start with you this time. What are some of your favorite Wayne Simmons memories, and what are some of your favorite qualities that he brought to the team during his time here? Um, I'm just going to go with my favorite memory from him, and it's actually an off-ice thing. It was the day of the, the trade, uh, or the last game that he played, so the, um, the outdoor game. Uh, I just thought it was really classy the way that he went about addressing the guys uh, in the locker room. Um, and I think that kind of exemplified things, you know, it, it was even in that moment of like, everyone kind of knew you, you just, you wore your last, uh, or you played your last game in a, in a flyer sweater out there. So, um, I think people were, were a little more emotional in that clubhouse than, or in that locker room than what you ordinarily would be after a, after a game like that. Um, and he kind of shifted that in a, a way that he shifted a lot of things, uh, here, to make it less about him and more about the the overall product of the team, and you know, it was basically that message of you know, no matter what happens, you know, I'm pulling for you boys, and let's let's go out there and uh, you know, finish and compete the rest of the way through this season. And I just kind of always felt that was the way they handled themselves handled himself on the ice too. Um, you know, so it was one of those moments I I appreciated for him. What's going on with your bets? Yeah, Brandon nice. Bolden scored a touchdown. <laughs> Put five bucks on that. Why? Well, never mind. He scored a touchdown. <laughs> what was the plus on that? Um, I'm not 100 percent sure. All right. Um, uh, it takes me two seconds. It was plus 350. Okay. Yeah, that was absurd. Like, how's Rex Burkhead is not going to play less odds? All right. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I won 17 dollars on it. Um, 
Uh, my favorite Simmons was probably every single even strength goal he scored. Because, because they're kind of few and far between. Yes. 100% why. <laughs> um, the man could score on the power play at will, basically, but whenever he scored an even strength goal, let alone it being like a dazzler, it was always exciting to see him. Like, it's finally going to happen. He's going to score more, more even strength goals. I like that rocket he had coming down against. Uh, yeah. When I said dazzler, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. I think mean, he had a deke <laughs> as well, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah, th- those are mine. And also, like, he was just, he was just a fantastic player and like when we traded when we did that mike richards trade obviously it was a hundred percent a thousand percent against it but you know looking up wayne simmons is like you know scouting report and like some of his games i'm like philadelphia is going to love wayne simmons and we did yep and he ended up being like that perfect like second liner like top end third liner who just killed it on the power play contributing in so many ways i thought he would be a solid penalty killer that didn't happen until his last like what two, two three, years two ish, two ish years here and then he he was solid so i was right in my analysis um but yeah he was just excellent player like you know just leader it seemed like as well um i really thought he fit he embodied what it's like to be a flyer in a way to be so cliche but it was time to move on and but, yeah, I will always appreciate Wayne Simmons' time here. I think that all Philadelphia and every Flyers fan can definitely attest to that. They'll certainly appreciate the co- contributions of Wayne Simmons. Always a team player, always one to put his body on the line. I think he, the one time he scored a goal off his face against Ottawa. I, I wanted to say it, but I knew someone else was going to say it, so I just went with it. Well, I actually wasn't going to go with that. I was just <laughs> citing that as an example of the fact that he's always putting his body on the line. Um, my f- my favorite Wayne Simmons moment actually was a game that I went to. It was game three of the 2012 uh, quarterfinals against Pittsburgh, the game that put them up 3 nothing, And it was back and forth through the first two periods. I think at this point the Flyers had a, I want to say it was 4-3 to three or 5-4 to four lead uh, late in the second period, final minute of the second period. And the Penguins had just had a great scoring opportunity, and the Flyers came back, they were rushing down ice, Braden Coburn hits Wayne Simmons for a breakaway. Perfect outlet pass. <laughs> Braden Coburn. Simmons goes in, does a nice little deke, beats Fleury on the backhand, and the place is going nuts. Wayne Simmons is so excited, he actually jumps into one of his teammates' arms <laughs> yeah. in a celebration. I forget who it was. might have actually been Coburn. But, yeah, the, the fact that... Uh, th- and this was back when Wayne Simmons was still you know, relatively good on skates and had some some <laughs> sort of speed that he didn't have in his later years in uh, Philadelphia. So two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, scored it that goal. He dropped off quick with that injury. He really did, like. yeah. Kind of a shame. But that goal, uh, I think he made a like, 6-4 game. The Flyers ended up winning the game 8-4. to four. And I just remember that being the turning point in that game because up until then, every time the Flyers would score, the Penguins would get it right back. It was a yeah. seesaw battle. And then... The Flyers finally got that two-goal edge and were able to run away with that hockey game. And that was a big turning point, obviously, in that series. The Flyers went on to eliminate the Penguins. And I just remember how loud the crowd was, how crazy the crowd was going when Wayne Simmons scored that goal. So it was it, for me, it was between that and between the uh, Game 6 hat-trick against the Rangers, I think it was in 2014. <laughs> But yeah, Wayne Simmons a lot of a lot of great memories. Ooh, that was a good point. That Wayne Simmons hat trick in that game six because yeah. I bought a hat that game. Never bought a hat at a game before, and then never went as a hat trick before. So they both intertwined to happen the same game. And my sister was like, "We actually going to throw?" I'm like, "I have to." Inspired so, so much hope that day. Run down to the closest I can get, and I see it circle off into like you know 102, <laughs> like row 14. <laughs> But yes, thank you, Wayne Simmons, there. for making me lose thirty dollars on a hat. But it was a pleasure to see. Oh, man. <laughs> Flyers inspired so much hope in that game, and then to complete the uh, the Dennis system, they separated it entirely in game <laughs> yeah. seven. <laughs> yep, I only say that because I actually watched that episode today. <laughs> <laughs> Good episode. <laughs> All right, so and Shane, you you brought this up, um, the Rage Room, a new addition at the Wells Fargo Center. How on brand for the city of Philadelphia. Yeah, seriously. I and love for it. this fan base. So what's what's your thoughts on it? Um I'm I guess I'm all for gimmicks and stadiums. 
Um, they also announced like a Gritty's room of some sort or Gritty's. Yeah, I, do, I couldn't find the Rage room, but I found the Gritty Command Center, yeah. which just seems silly. That seems the silly. The Gritty Command Center just seems ridiculous. Yeah. I think um, they like, choose what he wears, which is just silly. Yeah, it's just, it's bizarre. Yeah, I, don't, um, I don't know what else involves. I think you that. leave with like a pack of some sort. Cool. Um, I thought, which like, probably means it costs like $40 to get in there. If you're leaving with a pack. It, it's a very small room. It's like probably it's tiny. smaller it's, than this studio. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's like a salon chair, it looks like. It's bizarre. Yeah. Um, I, I thought, like, original, like, Grady Command Center, that must be the rage room. And right. I, don't, I don't think it is. I don't think it is either. I couldn't find it. I um, walked around the concourse four times. I did not because I was late. Yeah, I got um, there at, like, five. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, well, you were in the city already. So. Yeah, and I, and I got down, like, really early. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I it's very on brand for the city of Philadelphia. And the Flyers fan base in general, I, I feel like it will be less utilized this year than in many years past. Um, <laughs> but I still think it's, like I said, I'm, I'm all for gimmicky things like that to bring an extra revenue to continue to upgrade the Concord section. It's just whatever. I really don't care. I'm going to smash your shit <laughs> at home, not for 80 bucks or whatever it is. It just but might burn something. Yes. <laughs> You know what would make it a not big smart? Hit? Yeah, having a life size cutout of Dave Haxtell, with his <laughs> emotionless oh, man. expression behind the bench. That, that might happen against Toronto. They might do it's that. True. That, that really would be actually should. really wise because when they were like advertising it on the jumbotron, I don't know if they did it on TV, but uh, they showed gritty like you know testing it out. And they had like a lamp with the Devils logo. Yeah, I think what they're trying to like kind of knock off is the predators with like that truck or whatever like you know that's for the right. home games and everything i think that's where they're trying to like you know knock off of um what i didn't understand was Carchiti. like his headline for the article was like 35 dollars for the rage room ed snyder's rolling around in his grave no he's not yeah right that's a that's, that's like another this. way to earn money and it fits your broad street bully mentality like that's a hundred percent an ed snyder thing and then other people are like this seems really stupid. Like, why do they do this? And then Dave Isaac was like, they probably just had a closet. And were like, someone was like, I have an idea, which completely makes sense. Like, oh, why yeah. don't we just fucking destroy fine. shit in here and charge people for it? That's it. Hey, if you guys spare closet lying around somewhere, might as well make money off of it, right? Yeah. If I like win a bet before the game, I might do it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah that, that's pretty much all my thoughts. Like, yeah, it's a thing. It happens. You know, it's not a terrible idea. It's not the stupidest. And it's actually kind of decent in a way. Yeah, it's I I dig it. I mean, I probably won't go there, but I dig the concept of it. Yeah, right. I don't need to go there. I do that enough at home. <laughs> yep. Oh man. Yeah, I do it enough to my liver. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you guys, any final thoughts on the state of the Philadelphia Flyers before we wrap up this segment here? <laughs> uh, I'm just so happy that hockey's fun again here in Philadelphia. I don't want to <laughs> totally continue to overreact to two games, but I'm going to do it. Um, it's such a breath of fresh air. The the personality of the team, the uh, dare I say grit of the team, the speed, the versatility. Um, seeing special unit, uh, special teams units or specialty team units, as Elaine Vigneault continues to call it. <laughs> um, it's it's a complete it's a complete game again. It's a complete team, and it's man, it's so fun. It's so damn fun. Steve, what about you? Um, I'm just happy that once Andy Walensky is healthy, he can be sent down, and we can bring up Joel Farabee or Morgan Frost and have Butterman as a scratch. No offense to him, but it will really complete, incre- it. complete the depth that we have and like mm-hmm. really like just make this team better, I think. Yeah, it's going to be a fun season. It's going to be a lot of fun watching Philadelphia Flyers hockey, and it would be even better to watch Philadelphia Flyers hockey if you get food from just food. You can hit them up at 215 215- 794 Food. They're located in Buckingham Green. That's one of their locations off of uh, 202 and York Road in Buckingham. They've also got a location at Delaware Valley College. That's uh, in New Britain, Pennsylvania. I I believe the Delaware Valley College location is actually off of Lower State Road. But, yeah, two locations. One at Delaware Valley College. One at Buckingham Green in Buckingham. Once again, Just Food. 215-794 Food. Treat yourself Take it home. So before we wrap up, before uh, I can't talk, be sure to find us on Twitter at ANY Podcast. You can find me at Radio underscore Rob. Steve, where can we find you? At Schmitty324. And Shane? A urinal any second, man. I got to take a leak, but I'm at Shane (laughs) (laughs) underscore me. 
You can also find us online at www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. Got plenty of great articles coming out. A lot of great articles that are already out. A couple Flyers articles as well that you can read up on. You can find us on iTunes, on Spotify, on Spreaker, wherever you listen to your podcast. If you're on iTunes, please give us a rating or a review. A rating and a review. Or else I will haunt you you. down. Yeah. (laughs) That is it for this episode of The Disciples of Ed. We will be back with hopefully a still undefeated episode next week. Dumb and lame.